For my thoughts on all the latest happenings in the NFL in a completely relaxed, unscripted format, be sure to check out my channel, JG9 News. And now, on with our feature presentation. Think of all the times you would bench a quarterback during a game. Most of the time, the scenario that plays down in your head when I say that is, quite simply, the quarterback was terrible, the team was losing, and the offense wasn't getting anything going. Your team is down by three scores in the half after putting up just three points, and your quarterback has thrown three interceptions? Time for the backup to come in. Fourth quarter of a four-score game and your quarterback's crossed midfield just twice and is completing less than 50% of his passes? Put in the backup. You get the idea. When a quarterback gets benched and pulled for someone else, it's usually a scenario very similar to that. At the very least, you don't see quarterbacks getting yanked when their team is winning, the outcome of the game is still in some doubt, and they're playing alright. I'm not talking about a situation where you're up by 35 points with 10 minutes left, so you pull the quarterback to prevent injury because you've got the win locked up and you're just going to run out the clock. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a 10-point game in the fourth quarter where your quarterback is playing fine, and you bring in a relief pitcher of sorts, defying all conventional logic and wisdom. Almost like if a team were to pull Patrick Mahomes despite being up 20-10 to 10 in the fourth quarter. Well, I bring that up because on opening day of the 1983 NFL season, that's exactly what this man right here, Detroit Lions head coach Monty Clark, decided to do. During a game against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, with his starting quarterback playing fine, with his starting quarterback perfectly healthy, and with his team winning the game, he decided that it was time to pull his starter and bring in the backup, confusing everyone even players on his own team, in the process. And the end result of this bizarre strategy? Well, it may surprise you. Because this is the story behind the bizarre time that the Lions benched their starting quarterback while winning. Before I talk about the actual incident in question, and the benching that didn't seem to make any sense on the surface, we need some context to understand the importance of the game at hand, and how everything was going. It's September 4th, 1983. It's week one of a brand new NFL season, and we find ourselves down at the Big Sombrero in Tampa for this NFC Central rivalry game between the Detroit Lions and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, as in, two teams that made the playoffs during the previous strike short in 1982 season. You'll always want to start the season off on the right foot, so in that regard, this game is a big one. And that's especially true, considering the fact that these are two divisional opponents. So this scheme could go a long way in determining tiebreakers, especially with how even the division has been over the past few seasons. For the Lions, this would be a nice win to have. Not just for those aforementioned reasons, but because the Bucks had won three straight against Detroit, including the 1981 win and in regular season finale for the NFC Central title. So for the Lions, this would be nice from a revenge standpoint, to say the least. As for how the game itself was going, three quarters in, and Detroit was the team on the front foot, leading it by two scores, leading it 8 0. Remember that back in 1983, there was no two point conversion in the NFL, so an eight point game was two possessions. And obviously, with a score like that, a big reason why the Lions were winning was because of their defense. They got a safety in the first quarter, they held the Bucks to just 154 yards of total offense through those three quarters, they were holding the Bucks to under three yards a carry, they were stuffing them just about every short yarded situation they had, third and one, fourth and one, you name it, the Lions were getting stops, and they were making life a living nightmare for whoever was back there under center at quarterback, constantly applying pressure and getting sacks. However, on the offensive side of the ball, that's not to say that Detroit was playing poorly. Obviously, it wasn't an A-plus performance, and no one would argue otherwise. When you've mustered up two field goals through three quarters, there's definitely room for improvement. It's not the greatest show on turf. Having said that, this man right here, starting quarterback Eric Hippel, was playing fine. He wasn't great by any means, but he was fine. Through three quarters, Hippel was 14 for 24 
completing over 50% of his passes for 174 yards and a passer rating of 63.5. The reason the Lions weren't scoring more wasn't so much because of Hipple, so much as it was a very inefficient running game and a sloppy team that was committing a lot of penalties, making it third and long. For some perspective on Hipple's performance, it was roughly in line with what quarterbacks were doing around this time. If we go back to 1982, so the previous season, the average quarterback was completing 56.4% of his passes. Hipple was two percentage points above that, so he was right in line. The average quarterback threw for 199 yards per game, or about 49 yards per quarter. Hipple was at 174 yards through three quarters, or 58 yards per quarter, so again, right in line. The average quarterback was throwing 1.4 interceptions per game, or 0.35 per quarter. Hipple had one interception through three quarters, so that's 0.33 picks per quarter. So again, right in line with what other quarterbacks were doing. The average quarterback was averaging 7 yards per pass attempt. Hipple was at 7.25, so again, right in line. This is all just to establish the fact that even though the Lions weren't lighting it up offensively, and even though Hipple had better days under center, his performance was not bad by any means. They were not winning in spite of him. He was playing like the average quarterback played around this time period. So with the Lions winning the game, with the Lions moving the ball, with the Lions having scored two possessions ago, and with Hipple looking more than fine under center in command of the operation, you would think that Hipple would finish the game, right? You would think that, barring anything crazy like an injury, or another interception, or a disastrous sequence, Hipple would finish the game, take the Lions home, and help the Lions start the season 1-0. Simply put, quarterbacks don't get benched in this spot. Quarterbacks still get yanked after putting up these numbers, especially back in 1983. However, despite the solid play by Hipple, and despite Hipple guiding the Lions to a lead after three quarters, head coach Monty Clark decided that it was time to make a change. Because despite Hipple playing more than fine, and playing right in line with what the average quarterback was doing around this time, Clark decided to pull this man right here from the game and remove him in favor of backup quarterback, Gary Danielson. And when asked about why Clark pulled Hibble from the game, his response was a bit strange to say the least. Clark said that he made the decision on an impulse, saying, Eric's played pretty well, but I thought a change was necessary. He then added, even Cy Young needed a relief, you know. In other words, Clark was treating this game for some reason, like a baseball game, where a quarterback plays for a bit, and then gets pulled for another quarterback to give the team a fresh arm out there and to throw the defense off from the same looks they've got in all game. Okay, but time out about the Cy Young comparison. I cannot get over that, because if you think about this for more than five seconds, you realize how insane this sounds on paper. You realize just how nuts everything sounds about pulling this man right here Eric Hipple, when you're comparing the situation to Cy Young. Number one, there's a massive difference between a pitcher needing relief and a quarterback needing relief. Pitchers need relief not because they're pitching poorly, but because their arm is getting tired and because they can't throw as hard or else they'll blow their arm out. A quarterback is not blowing his arm out after throwing 30 passes the same way that a pitcher might blow his arm out after throwing 120 pitches that top out at 95 miles per hour. A quarterback's arm is not getting tired, the same way that a pitcher's arm may get tired. You think managers want to take out pitchers when they're playing well? Of course not, but they have to because it's unhealthy to leave them in and could be catastrophic. That's not a thing with quarterbacks. That has never been a thing with quarterbacks. That's like excusing a football player from showing up to a game because, in your eyes, even baseball players take games off, not realizing that this is an apples and oranges comparison. And a baseball player taking one game off out of 162, which is incredibly normal and healthy, is drastically different from a football player taking one game off out of 16. Taking a pitcher out for a reliever when he's playing well 
is done out of necessity for their health due to the fear of a dead arm. In other words, it's the exact opposite of a quarterback getting pulled when he's playing well. Literally, everything is different. And number two, Cy Young? Your comparison with Cy freaking Young? Your comparison to Eric Hipple and pulling this guy right here that you've been watching this whole time, mid game, for Gary Danielson? was to compare him to arguably the greatest pitcher of all time, and a guy who was notorious for throwing complete games? Young threw 749 complete games in his career. He did not get yanked. He did not get pulled. His 749 complete games will forever be a record, as no one else is even in the same stratosphere as him. For some perspective, the top player in complete games who is active today is Justin Verlander, who has 26. Cy Young has 749. 26, the leader right now amongst active players, versus 749. Very famously, Young did not need relief. In fact, from 1890 to 1905, in that 16 year stretch, Young started 639 games and completed 602 of them completing over 94% of his games. You couldn't use, quite literally, any other pitcher to make that comparison? Have you, uh, have you ever watched baseball in your life? This is like me saying that I want my quarterback to throw long passes every now and then, even though he's great at throwing short passes. Because even Shaquille O'Neal, as dominant as he was down low, shot three-pointers. You, you, you have a fundamental misunderstanding of how the game works if that's your comparison, and if that's your reference point. As you might expect, this was confusing enough where after the game, this man right here that you've been watching this whole time, Eric Hipple, was understandably asked about what the heck Monty Clark's strategy was, and what his thoughts were. On one hand, Hipple was a good team player, and didn't throw a fit over this decision, or publicly criticize his coach for making the move. On the other hand, yeah, Hipple was baffled, like any sane person would be in that spot. Said Hipple, Anytime you get pulled, you feel like you failed. And it's logical for Hipple to feel that way because this was not talked about before the game, and it's not the conventional thing to pull quarterbacks to the middle of the game, especially when they're playing well and the outcome is in doubt. Hipple then added, I was a little surprised when Coach Clark made the change, because we were up by 8 points. I don't know what he saw, but I'm not going to let it bother me. I guess it is like Mommy says. Even Cy Young needed a relief pitcher sometimes. Again, I am begging any of the players on the Lions to watch one singular baseball game. Just one baseball game. Cy Young was the last guy who needed a relief pitcher. How can you possibly think Cy Young needed relief when he threw complete games over and over again and did a record that will never be broken, even if robots take over the world and have the capacity to pitch every single day. I, I digress, I digress, I digress. Regardless, this was the decision. Monty Clark was taking this man right here out of the game. A game in which the Lions were up by 8 points, and a game which was in doubt for a backup quarterback for no easily identifiable reason. The end result? Well, amazingly enough, this strategy actually worked. Turns out, the decision made by this man right here in Monty Clark to bench a quarterback who was playing fine and who had gotten you the lead didn't backfire in any way whatsoever, because the Lions ended up winning the game by a final score of 11 to nothing. To be fair, you just needed a quarterback who wasn't colorblind and wasn't going to throw the ball to the other team, because with the way Detroit's defense played and with how inept the Bucks looked all day on the offensive side of the ball, the Lions were never going to allow the Buccaneers to score points of any kind. Tampa finished the game averaging less than 3 yards per carry, turning it over 3 times, and taking 7 sacks. However, that is no discredit whatsoever to the play of Gary Danielson off of the bench, who you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. The decision by Clark to bring on Danielson actually worked out, because Danielson came on a relief during the 4th quarter, and went 8 for 9 that quarter with 89 yards passing, with the Lions having 118 yards of total offense in the fourth quarter alone, which could have been more 
if not for the obvious conservative nature of their offense at the end when they were just running the ball, falling forward, taking knees, and killing the clock. The Lions held onto the ball for 13 of the final 15 minutes of the contest. This strategy actually panned out alright, and Clark was adamant that this was akin to a starting pitcher getting pulled for a reliever, as Hipple would start all 16 games in the regular season, helping guide the Lions to a playoff appearance and an NFC Central title. If Hipple was the starting pitcher that put together a quality start and gave you six good innings of work, Danielson, in this case, was the closer who retired the side and made easy work of the opposition out of the bullpen. And yes, Danielson would come in for quite a few games in 1983, with one of them being their Thanksgiving game against the Pittsburgh Steelers, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But every time that Danielson came in, it was either with the Lions holding on to a commanding lead, or with Hipple playing like garbage or the Lions losing and needing a spark. From everything I could tell, this was the only time that this man right here, Monty Clark, pulled Eric Hipple during a win that was in doubt while he was playing well. Which is what makes this strategy all the more bizarre, as if it wasn't strange enough already. Again, this is something that you don't see coaches do. Heck, like I said before, Clark even admitted that even though Hipple was playing well, he made this decision entirely off of an impulse with the thought being, what if we treat this like a baseball game? Granted, the Buccaneers were a laughing stock in 1983. They ended the year 2-14, and 14, so anything would have probably worked against them. But credit where credit is due. On this day, Monty Clark's strategy actually worked. George Carlin famously has a comedic skit about how different football and baseball are from each other. But on this day in 1983, in the eyes of Monty Clark, maybe they weren't so different after all. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe, as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9pm Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.